Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Intentional Wisdom Podcast. I'm your host, Greg Campion, and I am absolutely delighted to be joined today by Dr. Hal Hirschfield. Dr. Hirschfield is a professor of marketing, behavioral decision-making, and psychology at UCLA's Anderson School of Management. He focuses his research at the intersection of psychology and economics. And his work has been published in the New York Times, Harvard Business Review, and the Wall Street Journal, to name but a few. He's also the author of a new book titled Your Future Self, which he and I discuss in detail in the following conversation. We take a deep dive into some pretty heady questions in this conversation, like whether or not we are the same person throughout the course of our entire lives. The book really got me thinking pretty hard about that one and how we can connect more with our future self. Think of yourself in 20, 30, or 40 years, and how such an improved connection could help us make better decisions today for our fitness, for our nutrition, our finances, even our relationships. Really interesting chat here. I think you're going to love it. Um, This episode is brought to you by Athletic Brewing Company. My listeners and newsletter readers know that I love athletic brewing, non-alcoholic brews. I love the quality. I love the variety. And I love that you can have them delivered straight to your door from athleticbrewing.com. That's super convenient. Um, But did you know that Athletic is also a certified B Corp, donating up to $2 million annually to protect and restore outdoor spaces around the globe in their Two for the Trails program. Personally, I love this company. I love that they give back to the community. I think it's a real reflection of the culture that they've built there. And supporting hiking trails and maintaining outdoor spaces is such a cool cause that Personally, I feel great about supporting when I drink athletic. So try athletic brewing non-alcoholic brews for yourself. Use code WISDOM to get 15% off your first order at athleticbrewing.com. That's code W-I-S-D-O-M at checkout for 15% off your first order. Near beer exclusions and conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company, fit for all times. All right, here is my conversation with Dr. Hal Hirschfield. All right, Professor Hal Hirschfield, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks so much, Greg. I'm happy to be here. I'm so excited to have you here. Um, I recently uh, was lucky enough to uh, read your new book, and congratulations on publishing your your new book. I have it right here in front of me. It's uh, awesome. a beautiful book, um, Your Future Self. I love the cover, actually. It's really cool Thank and you. colorful and um I love the, love the design but it's a really you know well researched book uh, and that's one of the things I love about it you know I talk a lot on this podcast about habit change and behavior change and things like that and always looking for interesting takes on these things and I loved that about the book that it combined both a real thorough research back uh methods and um uh and theories uh, with uh, storytelling and like really good engaging examples of stories. So, um, so kudos to you for for getting Thank that you. done. I'm sure that was um, quite a labor of love uh, getting <laughs> yeah. a book to the finish line. Something like that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now you've been, um, t- I think, thinking and talking and probably writing about this topic for some time. Uh, yeah. In fact, I know that because I found a old TED talk of yours on YouTube yeah. from almost a decade ago where you were That's talking right. about similar topics of, you know, sort of future self, and past self and that sort of thing. So I guess let's start there. Tell me, you know, what was your original interest in this topic and why did you decide to write a book about it? Yeah. I mean, the the original interest, you're right. The seed was planted long ago. I mean, to, to some extent, it was when I was in graduate school. My mentor is, you know, a psychologist who also sits at the intersection of policy, um, Laura Karstensen. And, you know, she and I were talking about sort of research topics. And uh, one of the things that came up was, you know, retirement. People don't have enough input from psychologists about this, which to me, you know, it didn't sound all that exciting. Um, uh, Frankly, you know, Mm -hmm. retirement when you're like in your early 20s. Right, right. That's not exactly (laughs) the top thing you've got on your mind, right? Doesn't really get you out of bed. That was kind of, to some extent, though, the exact 
that feeling was exactly what sort of led me down this path because it was like, well, why does it have to be this way? And I started sort of digging in and trying to understand, well, why do people have such a hard time thinking about the very long term? Um, but quickly realized that the interests that I had weren't, weren't just about financial decision making, wasn't just about retirement per se, but about any of these sorts of decisions that involve, you know, trade-offs between the things that I want right now and the things I know I like maybe should do or even yeah. want to do for the future, right? And I wanted to write the book to really like bring all that together and bring it to an audience that wasn't um, just other academics. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. Um, I have to ask you this just as somebody who like, who produces content um, and it loves producing content. Like how on, I'm looking at the back of this book and it is like a who's who had blurred this book. So <laughs> Oliver Berkman, who wrote 4,000 Weeks, um, Angela Duckworth, author of Grit, who is just amazing. Carol Dweck, who wrote Mindset. I mean, Daniel Pink, Adam Grant, like this is a who this is actually what you know what this is this is like my dream podcast list so I'm I'm going I'm going to hit you up afterwards for all their personal phone numbers but how how did you uh get all of those guys so they do you happen to know them or was it a publisher or how did how did you get all those Yeah m- most of them I pretty much all of them I know now you know through you know just through doing this work um they 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 you know to some extent they're my heroes uh too and I've learned yeah. from them over the years Oliver was probably the one I hadn't known that well, but I got introduced to, and he and I had a great chat. He was, he was enormously helpful in helping me think through the the ending of the book. Mm. Um, and I was lucky to to send this to these folks, and they read it and agreed to you know to 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 blurb it. There's a whole process there. Yeah, <laughs> but it yeah, was yeah. you know I felt I felt very fortunate to have them backing them back. Well, that's awesome. I mean, I think yeah. the the book is the book speaks for itself, and uh, I'm sure these people don't put their names uh, on any book. So this is that's really cool to see. And yeah, Oliver Berkman, thank you, Greg. Uh, his book Four Thousand Weeks. Uh, that one was really interesting. Like I I I read that book like expecting it to be a productivity book, and I guess it kind of yes. was, but it was a, more of a like life philosophy book. Yeah. Uh, it was- it was so, I felt the same way. I mean, it was so interesting because of course he's this like productivity guru. This guy has like tried everyone. I mean, it's, you know, what a great sort of hook for his book is to sort of say like, I've tried all these things and like, <laughs> they're basically wrong. And, <laughs> you know, the, the way that, that, you know, I think, I think people really appreciate something that's freeing that sort of lets them, you know, not do the hard thing. And to some extent, I, you know, that was an angle of my book too, but you know, it, it may get thought of differently, but you know, I thought one of the things he does so well there is sort of, you know, make the point that the more productive we are, the more things we have to do. And so you just create an endless cycle, you know, yeah, but yeah. It, you're right. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful meditation on sort of life philosophy as well. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about your book. So, um, oh, so yeah, one sure. of the, um, one of the big questions that you explore in this book, and I'm not sure I had really fully deeply thought about it myself um, in the lead up to, to reading your book, but is the idea of, are we the same person uh, throughout our entire lives, right? And that's, it's kind of like a heady question to, to think about. And I started thinking about it myself and like, I had always kind of I think just assumed, okay, yes, I'm basically the same person throughout my entire life. Now you can argue that, okay, maybe since I was a teenager, maybe every cell in my body has completely, right. you know, right. regenerated itself by now. So maybe there's an argument that actually you're a completely, totally different person now physically, but you know, that's a whole separate argument. But, you know, one thing I think about uh, for myself as I look back, let's say 20 years ago, and I say, I'm 45 now, 25 years old. I was pretty different in terms of, and I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of us are this way, uh, but I was actually much more extroverted then, which is kind of ironic because I host a podcast now, but yeah. I, I would say I'm in, in those days, I more got energy from being around tons of people, right. from right. being uh, out late, you know, drinking alcohol, this and that. Now I'm like totally opposite. Maybe it's just getting old or getting mature or whatever. But now it's like, I love being home. I love reading book. I love, you know, I'm not a drinker these days. I get my enjoyment out of more one-to-one level conversations. But 
let's talk about that big question of, you know, how do you even start to think about, are we the same person like throughout our entire lives? So first off, I love your, your anecdote there, because I think it's, I think it's relatable on the surface. I think a lot of us probably do think, yeah, yeah, I'm like basically me. And then, you know, if you really just push on that a little bit, I think it quickly unravels. You know, your your example is one that resonates with me. I used to, you know, I remember in like high school and college, like I was the guy that was like running around to different groups to talk to the people I knew and, you know, at a party. And and now I vastly prefer, um, you know, being more on a one-on-one yeah. setting and whatnot. And, and, you know, like you said, some of that could be age. But the reality is that, once you start considering the many ways in which we've changed, not, you know, there's surface level things. I live in a different city. I have new friends now, you know, some of the old too, obviously. It becomes really hard to sort of say, yeah, the most accurate description of me is that I am one person. And so I think, you know, the better description, the the one that sort of really reflects more of reality is something philosophers have talked about, this idea that we're sort of a collection of separate selves. Hmm. And I think... It's a strange notion. Like you said, these are sort of big, heady questions. And, you know, I don't mean to <laughs> get too, too sort of high level and abstract. But I do think the idea that, you know, that we're really kind of a collection of separate people. And there's a, there's a strand of connection between them. Um, that suddenly makes a little bit more sense when we think mm-hmm. about, you know, who we are over time. Yeah, yeah. And I think one of the things that you've, did a really great job in this book is uncovering some stories around people who kind of personify this or bring this to life in terms of um, showing some pretty amazing transformations where you could argue this is almost a completely different person. So I guess I'm curious, like in your work, in the work that you've done, what some of the more shocking transformations are that you've come across? Yeah. I mean, so that, you know, the, the, (laughs) The most shocking one is one I spotlighted in the book, you know, this, this, well, Brazilian serial killer, um, Pedro, Pedro, uh, Filo Rodriguez. He, you know, he, um, he was sort of the most notorious serial killer in Brazil. He was the basis for Dexter because he would essentially like only kill criminals. Um, and at some point, you know, he's in prison and he has this sort of like aha moment where he says, if I can get out of solitary and get out of this situation, I'll like, I'll never kill again. And like, that is, in fact, what he does. And because of this weird loophole in the Brazilian penal code, he gets released from prison after 35 years, which is wild, right? This is yeah, yeah. not somebody in the American system who would ever, right, <laughs> ever see the right. light of day. Yeah. Um, but he gets out and he is like on a surface level, and I think probably even on the deep one, a different person. He like, he doesn't drink, he doesn't party, he doesn't violently he has a job he goes to he wakes up early and works out he has this youtube channel where he does you know um sort of like preventative talks for at-risk youth and i talked to him because i thought here's in a case of somebody who's like really made a transformation and one of the things he said to me was he was like disgusted by the person he once was and Mm. like admittedly we must scrutinize this story yes Yeah. (laughs) yeah but but like you know my my sort of telling of it and the reason i'm bringing it up now is not because i think you know yes i like 100 percent believe him that he doesn't have any more violent urges etc that's not my job my job here is to say well are there cases in which we can look almost as if we're different people and this is an extreme one but i think it's it can be representative of some of the less extreme changes that we all go through yeah 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 that one that was a really fascinating story and uh i mean crazy that this per that this guy was like brutal violent serial killer and committed something like what was it like 20 plus murders uh in the course so of his life before he got to prison and then in prison he killed i mean the, the these numbers are hard to verify but yeah. it, you know somewhere on the order of 30 people oh my gosh. you know That's while like, he's there so i mean you know his count is like something like 70 total you know this wow. is Obviously, there's debate about this, right? Okay. But, um, yeah, wild. So, and, so that's pretty yeah. insane. I mean, one of the things that I was uh, kind of, I don't know, I felt a little 
uh, nervous for you when I was like, <laughs> okay, you were you were talking to this guy. I, I understand. I think he's since passed away, but I think so. You yeah, were yeah. You were talking to this guy. I think like on a Zoom, like over uh, through a translator, and yeah. and then writing about his story. I was kind of thinking in the back of my mind, like, are is that a risky thing to do? Like, because <laughs> like, if you wrong this guy in some way, like, yeah, I know. do you want to be associated? Like, were you yeah. worried about that at all? Well, I was a little bit, you know, it, it's funny that you say that because, you, you know, even my translator said, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of create a fake, you know, an extra alias email address. Cause I don't necessarily want to be, you know, associated with him. And the, the reason I say that this is sort of interesting is because of course, the story starts with this premise that he is now a different person. Yeah. And yet if we have some of these worries, it's suggestive that like we can't fully always see that in others. Yeah. Right. Like right. We, we sort of want to see some sort of consistency and permanence, even if it's difficult in this case, I think we put on our, you know, we put our guard up now, look, yeah, in this particular case, I, you know, there was nothing about this conversation that was going to be sort of, um, or I hope there wasn't, that was going to be, you know, paint him in a negative light other than talking about, you know, what he'd done. And he, you know, agreed to yeah, all yeah. that. Right. But, um, I, you know, I think he was also, look, it was through translator. Um, but I got the sense both in his sort of, uh, you know, intonation and also through the translator that I think he was quite excited to be talking about this. And like, I think he really felt, I, I I'm not sure if the right word is pride. I don't think it's quite that, but like, he there there was something sort of prideful or accomplishment like about being the version of himself who he is now and wanting to share that yeah yeah um, with me well that's 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 wild and obviously that's a extreme case um is totally there anything extreme. that comes to mind in terms of some of the transformations that you've seen that are maybe like a little bit more subtle <laughs> well honestly the story that you told starting this is exactly the type of it's the exact type of transformation that I think we do, we do see, you know, mm -hmm. in, um, so, you know, it's hard for me to say, well, there's in some ways I don't have like a, an, an like a individual anecdote because, yep. because it's more subtle. It's like less, you know, it's like less obvious to pick up on these things. Yeah. But you know what the research suggests is that if you look at sort of the big five personality traits, um, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, neuroticism, um, in a 10 year span, we can expect one of those to change pretty significantly within ourselves. And the reason I bring this up is because there's some really interesting nuance here. On the one hand, it's it's wild to think that one of those might change in a big way. Like for you, I think it's extroversion. And I, mm -hmm. I might say the same for me. On the other hand, 80% of them, you know, the other four stay the same roughly. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so it depends on where you sort of shine your light you shine your flashlight to say like, well, what am I uncovering here? Right. And so I think that's sort of a subtle version of like, we do go through changes. We morph over time. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one of the things that we, um, I think actually, I, I guess I've never really seen it through this like future self, uh, lens before, but a lot of what we talk about on this podcast is things that could be seen through that light. So it's, it's things like habit change, behavior change, you know, how do you improve right. things like your habits around exercise and nutrition, that sort of stuff. So there's a basic conundrum that we all face, right? And that basic conundrum is that how much should we sacrifice today um, to make our future, the life, the life of our future self easier, better, however you want to paint it. Um, so there's, there's a trade-off there. And I think in the research that you and your colleagues have done, you've basically come to the conclusion that the closer we identify with that future self, um, maybe the easier gets, maybe the easier that behavior change mm. or healthy habits get. So maybe, maybe tell me how you sort of found your way to that conclusion. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because I, you, you, and you said it easier and I think that's a, it's an interesting interpretation because in reality, I don't know if we know that it's in fact easier or that people are just more likely to do it who mm -hmm. have that, that sense of closeness. So, I mean, how do we find our way to that? You know, 
from a almost from a philosophical standpoint, we, we started with the perspective that our future selves may seem like other people. But then what matters for our decisions is the exact same thing that matters for our likelihood to take care of our loved ones, which is, do we feel close to them or not? Mm. And we sort of translated that, you know, if I'm, if my future self is somewhat like another person, will I be more likely to do things for their benefit if I feel a shared sense of connection and emotional bond to them? So, you know, for what it's worth, from like a research standpoint, it was really hard to figure out how do we even ask people about this? Because it's, you know, you, you've sort of circled around it. It's not something maybe you think about, right? It's yeah. like, uh, it's a lot easier to ask people a, a whole host of other questions uh, about, you know, their self-esteem and, you know, um, how they think of themselves. Um, my, you know, this was years and years ago. My, I had a master's student I was working with, Tess Garten, who she had, you know, come across this sort of relationship literature, Art Aaron and Elaine Aaron. They're these like, you know, relationship scientist gurus. And they had come up with a very clever way to ask people how they feel about their romantic partners. And the, they, they sort of came up with this theory they call the inclusion of the other and the self that the, you know, the more we sort of incorporate somebody in our self-concept, the more connected we are to them. And they gave, they gave people these, um, essentially it's like a picture of circle that range from not overlapping to all the way overlapping. And they said, you know, pick the group of circle that represents how you feel about your spouse or your partner. Mm -hmm. So like and how much a part of you are they or vice versa that's like right no, no, i think you said it right are you as almost like one identity is that that's completely right. separate identities or is it like completely the same identity? is that right that's right that's right and those answers matter they they predict relationship success they predict um uh you know likely to make a sacrifice for your partner and so mm -hmm. on and so you know mm -hmm. we, so we had this realization together that, like perhaps this would be a good um tool that we could use to uh, ask people about their own future selves and mm -hmm. essentially show them these sort of overlapping circles and say, you know, pick the group of circles that right. represents how similar you are, connected you are to your future self. Is that 70 year old guy the same as you or is that a completely different yeah. self than you? And it's, you know, it's like, um, well, it's funny because, you know, I started by thinking, oh, the, what we should be asking is like, are they the same as you or not? And I think that's a version of it. And probably, you know, I don't mean to be splitting hairs here, but I think, you know, the the sort of like better way to think about it is not, you know, are they the same per se, but are they similar? Are they somebody mm -hmm. that I share a sense of connection with, okay. right? Because, yep. you know, it's like my my wife is not the same as me, but I can feel right. similar to her. I can feel connected to her. Yes. And in almost in a way, like if she was the same as me, I don't know if that would make, I don't know how that would impact our, what would, I don't know how that would apply to relationship uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> closeness. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. So how did you, how did you end up actually like testing that? Like what method did you use to actually test that? So we've done a variety of things. We've, you know, literally asked people pen and paper, how similar do you feel to your future selves? Um, using those circles measures, you know, or just asking them. Um, and, you know, then we relate that back to things like asset accrual and other concepts like, um, you know, how likely are you to adopt an ethical stance when it comes to, business dilemmas and how likely are you to exercise and 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 so on and so on um so we've also looked at this using neuroimaging methods finding out that uh you know on some neural level the future self almost looks like another person mm. on a average but then interestingly people sort of differ on just how much the future self looks like sort of a distant other versus a close other and the 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 greater the distance, the more likely people are to act impatiently. They're going to choose, you know, uh, to just get like a small financial reward right now rather than wait for something for later. Um, so these are, you know, those are just two of the methods that we've used, but it's, you know, it's like a little tricky to come up with the best way to kind of capture the relationship people have. And those are yeah. some of them. Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah. I mean, that, that concept to me was one that really stuck with me from the book is that this idea that the more closely you see that future self as similar to yourself, same to yourself, I don't know, um, the more likely you are to um, 
uh, behave in ways today that are healthy. Let's use you know fitness or nutrition as an example. And so I want to ask you like how you ultimately get there in like what are some methods you could do to sort of you know bring yourself closer to to that future self. But before we get there, let me yeah. just ask you this: What is the end of history illusion? <laughs> yeah, um, that's that is a research um, uh, sort of like you know illusion or effect that was uncovered by Jordy Quadbach and Dan Gilbert and Tim Wilson, and it's this fascinating idea that people feel as if they are baked now. And what I mean by that is what they find is that people recognize that they've changed some from the past to the present. Um, but then they somehow think that the rate of change will slow down mm. as they go from the present to the future. That, you know, I, th I sort of am who I am now. I finally have arrived, whatever now yeah. is. Yes. It's an illusion because we change as much from the past to the present as we do from the present to the future. And it, it's, it's almost confronting to say that because we say, no, 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 that can't be. Like, I've now arrived. You know, when I talked to Dan Gilbert about this, one of the things that he said to me when I interviewed him, he was mid-60s, 64, I think. And he said, I changed as much from 54 to 64 as I did from 44 to 54, but I never would have predicted that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that, you know, you and I are about the same age. And it, I, yeah, sure, things have changed. I've become, in the last 10 years, I've become a parent and, yeah. and moved. And But now it's, you know, somehow I'm going to sort of not coast, but like more or less be who I am. Yeah. I think we want to think that. I think we're motivated to think that, mm -hmm. you know, because we want to think that we're now the best version of ourselves and we'll keep, you know, being that way. Um, but the the problem with that thinking is it can lead to unfair decisions for our future selves. If we somehow think that they won't change and that they won't morph and alter in mm. the ways that we have in the past, then we we may lock them into things. Um, that's really not fair for their sort of well-being. That's pretty wild to to think about. Um, yeah, I mean, you think about like the conversation we had up front, just like, oh, you know, I've changed so much in the last 20 years. I used to be extroverted. Now I'm introverted, blah, blah. And, and even me thinking about that, I'm like, I'm fully baked now. This is who I am now. I'm going to be the same. Sure, I'll yeah. be the same at 65 and 75. I mean, I've totally reached maturity here now, right? But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's wild to think about that. You know, you know what's uh, funny to me to think about too is like fashion. I don't know if you ever thought about that as part of this, but like I always think about like you look at pictures of yourself from like 10 or 20 years ago. Oh God, like what was those sunglasses I was wearing? And like, you know, Although, although I will say, I, I, I do have this theory that like the type of jeans that you prefer to wear stops like at senior year of high school. Well, you know, it's, um, it's funny because I have had this same feeling, especially with fashion. I, I remember, I remember once about, it must've been 12 or 13 years ago, I was like walking out of a bathroom at work and I looked at what I was wearing and I thought, will I find this to be dated <laughs> <laughs> 10 years like the jeans out there are yeah. kind of baggy yeah yeah and it it is it is sort of a funny thing because i think we implicitly know or not even implicit i think we explicitly know that fashions change yeah. and we know that the things we're wearing right now are not going to be the things that we're going to wear in 10 years 15 years mm -hmm. and i don't think that we apply the same level of thinking to our personalities mm -hmm. And it's probably easier, you know, to, it's easier to not because, you know, our personalities are so closely that t tied to identity and we don't want to think about our identity as somehow unstable. What I wear my jeans, whether they have cargo pockets or not, um, you know, they don't for what it's worth, but, um, the, <laughs> that, uh, but trust me in the late nineties, I was big, big cargo guy. Oh, they, <laughs> they definitely did, you know, yeah. and I, I don't have my, um, you know, my hemp necklace anymore oh, either. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. um, had a few of those hanging around as well. <laughs> That's if you go to a fish concert, I mean, that's, that's, I was going to say, I haven't been to that in a while or a Dave Matthews show, but you know, but those are, those are not identity, not always identity relevant, right? Those are kind of surface level and we can appreciate the change and, and be okay with it. Yeah. 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 It reminds me, I just, I just had all of my suits from like 15 years ago taken away in cause I just, I just tried them on recently and like coming out of COVID, put these suits on. I'm like, oh my gosh, really? This is like, I could put two legs into each, each pant leg here. The style has definitely changed. I, I know exactly. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> um, 
So anyhow, the um, uh, you mentioned the in terms of this idea of okay, if we think that we want to more closely identify with our future selves, we think that may be a way to uh, help lead to you know positive changes in our behavior that we want to make. Um, you mentioned I, I, you talked about some different things in the book around you know one is like seeing a digital avatar of yourself like right. aged. Another is like re- letter writing, but talk to me about some of those methods that you've seen, uh, you know, potentially be effective around connecting you more with that future self. So, you know, you mentioned two of the big ones, right? So one is to, or on a general level, try to figure out how we can make the future self more vivid in, in an effort to make it more emotional, mm. um, which can sort of draw us closer to that future self. And so you know, we can show an age progressed image. You know, I've done this in some of my research and admittedly, there's something a little gimmicky about that. That's It's really supposed to be more of a demonstration, you know, yeah. that like we can make the future more vivid. I also really like this idea that um, Yuta Shishima and Ann Wilson came up with where they have people write a letter to their future self, but then they write a letter back from their future self. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. And, and, and it, it's so nice because you're you're really kind of forcing you to step into the shoes of your future self. I think it could happen if I just, you know, pull up one of these age progressed images or like visualize the future deeply. But it almost makes it a little easier to actually like do the work of empathizing and seeing the world through my future self's eyes and, you know, stepping into their shoes if I write that letter back from them. Um, so, th- you know, those are two ways that I can think of to like bring that future self closer. You know, another method that just came out in a recent paper that came out after I even, you know, finished the book, um, by Charles Chu and Brian Lowry, they they asked people to think of think of two things that will be consistent between now and the future hmm. and future you. And it it's it, I don't think it's a super easy exercise because we, you know, we live in a sort of state of uncertainty. Future is even more so. Mm-hmm. But if push came to shove, I could come up with two things. And if I really think deeply about it, I think it can like kind of help let some of those other uncertainties melt away a bit and figure out, you know, at the core, what am I going to, what will, what will make for that connection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I like the letter writing uh, idea and I like the, I like the writing back one. Um, That, that seems like a really worthwhile exercise to go through and to try that out. And, um, uh, it does, definitely would put you in those other shoes and think, okay, yeah, like put yourself, like me, 45, put myself in the shoes of 65-year-old Greg, write a letter back to me and say, this is what, you know, I wish I had known or this is what I would have focused on or something like that. Maybe it could make that a little bit more real or even like this is what I do day to day. And this is what I'm happy that I did when I was your age, right? Because I think about, like, I just yeah. read um, Peter Atiyah's um, Outlive yeah. uh, book, and, and that is, a lot of that is about uh, how do you, what can you do now at, you know, 30, 40, 50 to set yourself up for age 90 so that you can walk up a flight of stairs or pick up right. a grandchild? And... So those are those that I could see that letter writing as being helpful in terms of just yeah. cementing that in your head a little bit. Like that's, I'm going there. That's going to be whether right. it's me or some other version of me, like I'm going there and there's, there's, there are things today I want to do to get myself ready. Um, I think that's right. You know, by the way, in part of the like, you know, marketing and promotion for the book, the um, one of my colleagues at UCLA, who's the sort of head of marketing communications, he's a real creative guy. And he had this idea of, you know, what if we make you not just, you know, look older with one of these apps, but he basically hired some Hollywood makeup artists. Uh. And I sat for several hours and they made me look like I was about uh, probably mid to early seventies. Wow. Um, and it was, I mean, it was a wild experience. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh, in fact, I, I walked out of my office, we did it at work. I walked out of my office and walked right by one of my very best friends at work. And he just kept walking. Like no, he had no idea he was walking by wow. me. Wow. 
uh, was just that assumed like, it was um, like was that like emotional at all because i wonder yeah, yeah so i was i was gonna say it it, it was you know th- this to me was like the you know the the letter writing exercise you know on steroids right and so i i went into the bathroom and i looked in the mirror um and it was deeply emotional because i felt this sort of weird almost like out of body experience where it was like look i woke up that morning you know me now in my you know mid 40s and then you were looking in the mirror and i'm looking at this version of me and it was the one of the first thoughts i had was how will i look back on this period of time in my life when i am this old Mm -hmm. and like what will i be feeling and how will i be sort of you know judging or auditing the things that I've mm-hmm, done over mm-hmm. time. I almost had this, it wasn't a sadness is not the right word for it. It was like a, like a poignancy of sorts of just feeling like, who will that version of me be? Like, what will life be like? It, like raised all these questions yeah. and it, you know, I've been studying this stuff for, for years yeah. and that experience was just it. I mean, it stayed with me. This was months ago and it's, you know, it's like, um, it, it's really, it was really, it was, it was quite wild. <laughs> That's got to be a total shock to the system. Um, I, yeah. So, if you wanted to sort of mimic that effect, uh, <laughs> uh, hire a Hollywood makeup yeah, artist. Yeah, I was going to say you don't <laughs> have direct access to a Hollywood makeup artist <laughs> and six hours of time. Yeah. Oh my gosh, uh, are there um, are there any apps that you've come across that are like pretty good at this? Because I would imagine the technology's got to be getting pretty amazing and if you don't have them offhand don't worry about it i can no no no, i do i mean the the technology is quite good you know so face app is really good um but you you have to kind of make a couple choices like face app it'll age your face and then you have to go in and like change the hair color too okay it's sort of like what you you have to kind of make it lighter yeah there's um honestly snapchat is really good at it there's like an age filter on it that i think is excellent oh it's excellent okay um i mean not all of these things work for everybody, yeah. you know, and yeah. like we, we went out to dinner with some friends and, uh, and, you know, we were sort of talking about this stuff and, and the, you know, the, the woman said like, Oh, you know, can you, can you do, do my face? And we did it. And it was like, nothing happened. Right. And right, I was like, right, right. Jody, this is the weirdest thing, but you look the same. Yeah. I tried multiple apps and it was like something about her face just didn't age. Um, so this is great news. Maybe for that's, you. Yeah. Um, maybe that's great news. <laughs> I, but point being, I, I think some of these things are, the technology is good. You know, I, I, I want to be like cautious here, right? It's like, and I think I know that people listening to this are are smart enough to recognize. It's not like you would just look at this and suddenly life changes, yeah, right? Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. you know, it, you know, to some extent it is about being intentional about like, what am I looking at here? What's my conversation with this person? Like, what am I thinking about? Yeah. But like, Printing it and being like, oh, that's cool. And then moving on, it's not going to do anything. I will, yeah, I do wonder though. I mean, I fully t- take all the points that you just made, but I, I do kind of wonder if, like, if you did get like a really good image that you were like, this is probably a pretty good indication of what I'm going to look like in like 30 years. Like, and you printed it out and you stuck it somewhere where you saw it regularly. I do wonder if that would encourage any behavior change. It's an interesting question. I mean, it, and admittedly, it's not something we've tested empirically. You know, that on the cautious side, you know, one thing that we're really good at is like eventually ignoring stimuli in our environment, right? Yeah. You know, it's yeah, like, yeah. I, I, who who hasn't downloaded the, um, you know, internet blockers or whatnot? And then, you yeah, know, I remember yeah. like after two oh, or three yeah, days, no, like, I'll, 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 I like hide Twitter like three folders deep in my iPhone. And then I'm like, yeah, I just go three folders deep every five minutes. I just go three folders thing, deep. You know? It's like, same. It's like, I've removed Instagram from my home screen, but I'm really good at just pulling down right. and searching for, you know, I just type in you know, I Anna and it's there. Um, now, you know, at some point we might habituate to it. On the other hand, you know, I when I was working on the book, I actually got this email from this, this like young adult, uh, this guy, Anmal, uh, and he reached out to me and he said during COVID, he was, you know, he was in high school and he was, really sort of hit a rough patch as many people did. And he's, you know, by himself at home. And he said all he was eating was like, oh, I'm blanking on the foods, but it was like essentially Chick-fil-A and like sugar cereal, you know, like uh, Captain Crunch or something mm-hmm. like that. He said he gained 30 pounds. Um, 
and he, you know, he'd come across some of this research and he printed out sort of this like, you know, ideal image of his future self, not when he was older, but, you know, just a, just like mm. a healthier, fitter yeah. version. And he yeah, put yeah. it on the fridge and he put it in his bathroom mirror. And he said he, you know, over six to eight months, I think it was, he eventually lost that weight, started exercising, yep. eating healthier. And, um, that right. helped motivate so that's what him. I need. I need like a jacked 65 year old version of myself to <laughs> be like, exactly. this is what you're going to be. All right. This is what you're going for. <laughs> this is it. Uh, okay, cool. So, um, you know, one, like I said, up front, I, I love the, all the research, um, and, uh, different testing that's gone into a lot of the, the, um, habit changing stuff that you got, that you explored. And I know that you and, and various colleagues over time have run all kinds of experiments. So it's really cool to see that um, actual implementation in, in that sort of setting. So um, as part of that, one of the things that you um, explore in the book is uh, commitment devices. So I want to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Um, anyone who follows me on social media will know, like, I love, a, I love a streak. I get into all these different challenges and stuff like that. So um, totally. I've done a hundred push-up challenge uh i've done it twice now and it's so it's a hundred push-ups a day for 30 days and cool. it's you time yourself for how long it takes you to do a hundred push-ups and then you kind of track that time um and i found it to be uh I, I found a couple of different i i don't know if you would call them commitment devices or not but a couple of different things have worked for me um in terms of like doing stuff like this one is um, the streak itself and like you just don't want to break a streak you know that's some motivational sure. tool another is having an accountability partner and I've, I, I've never Absolutely. been good at this but I've always kind of known that accountability partner is like a good thing and like the first totally. time I did this one of my buddies I convinced to do it with me and like every day we would just text each other okay I just finished it boom boom this was my time you know whatever and I would not um, open his text until I had done the push-ups myself. Like that was my kind of check on myself, right? But of course, I also didn't want to be the one who failed to do it that day. Right. Um, and then right. the third thing was like public commitment to goals. So the most recent time I did this, it was I put it out on Twitter and actually got an amazing response. I get, ended up getting like 30 or 50 people are all like, I'm in, let's do this. And everybody was no way. Um, it's great. going back and forth and posting their times every day. So anyways, um, that's a long-winded way of asking you to tell me a little bit about yep. commitment devices and like, you know, why you think they're effective and maybe some examples. So, you know, I mean, the, the, the thinking here, the idea here is, let, you know, let's go back to this idea of separate selves, right? And in this particular case, I think it can get like really fun to think about this. There's there's this there's this version of me right now that you know wants to be healthy. I want to I want to do the hundred pushups every day, and then there's this you know future self call it the the me in a month that like he wants to look back and say I did it right, mm -hmm. and then and then there's the guy each day, each successive version of me that's like got to find the time and like oh man I haven't done my pushups yet and I also really want to watch another episode of of jury duty. <laughs> and I'd rather just do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's like, there's going to be the guy, hopefully that wasn't that obscure of a reference. I think it's like the funniest <laughs> show on TV right now. Um, <laughs> All right. There, there, there's, there's gotta be the guy. There's gotta be the version of me that just sort of like follows through on the thing that I set out to do. And so what commitment devices do is sort of help put on some guardrails. So that sort of like present self version of us doesn't, doesn't mess it up. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, you talked about a couple um, sort of aspects of commitment devices. Um, the versions that you talked about are what, what economists would call soft commitments. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, for instance, um, like you having a public commitment, there's no punishment involved if you don't do it. The only punishment essentially is psychological, where you feel bad that you went, you know, if you don't do it, you feel like now you're not a reliable person. And I bet you that you see yourself as a reliable person, right? And so in an effort to preserve that sense of reliability, you will follow through. Um, the accountability partner is like another version of this. It is a somewhat soft commitment because it, it ramps things up a bit so much so that 
if I fail to follow through on my goal, I'm not letting myself down. I'm letting someone else down. And that doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. Um, now if, if I can go even further and introduce what's called a, you know, a punishment in there. Right. And so what if, you know, you told your buddy that you're going to do a hundred pushups a day, but you put a wager on there, Mm. you know, and, and you each send each other a check and you send him a check for 500 bucks and, and if, you know, if you fo- don't follow through, he gets to cash it, mm-hmm. you know, that, mm-hmm. that, that, that could mm-hmm. be pretty strong. Yeah. You know, one more thing to note, there's this recent analysis of a website called stick.com. It's two Ks. I'm sure, you know, you may have talked about it before. It's a great website that allows you to create these sort of commitments. You can get an accountability partner. You can implement a punishment, give the credit card, your credit card over, you know, pick an anti-charity that is, you know, like a group you don't want to donate I've to. I've heard you talk about that before. If you're, if you're yeah. in a blue state or something like that, like to have, have it be, you know, donate to the Republican Party or a candidate exactly. or something like So Craig Brimhall is a, he's actually a postdoc at UCLA. He did this study and it was, this was sort of an, you know, incidental finding, but the commitments that involved the punishment, people were four times as likely to follow through on them. Hmm. And it, the, the, the sort of difficulty here is when it comes to commitment devices, we have to make the the device part, the whether it's the punishment or the accountability part or whatever it is, we have to make that powerful enough to really deter our unwanted behavior. But it can't be so powerful that we just fail to sign up altogether. So yeah. this is like an idiosyncratic thing. We've got to really kind of figure out how to walk that tightrope there so that we do the thing. <laughs> um uh, in a way that like pushes us through. So, so what would be like a realistic example that you could actually implement of a punishment? So, I mean, I do think the financial punishment is a great one. Now, you know, where this becomes idiosyncratic is like, what will, what will be seen as something that like I'll actually follow through on, you know, like if you sent your buddy a $20 check, um, you could be the type of person where, or you could be in a situation where twenty dollars—that's like enough of a motivator. Like you don't want to give him twenty dollars, you know. Or you could say, "Well, that's you know, not that big of a deal." So I'm going to really up it, you know, make it two hundred, um, you know. But if it was a thousand dollar check, you might say, "Like I'm just not doing this," mm-hmm. and like he's not going to cash it because he's going to feel too bad, you know. So it, this is where it's like individual, right? I mean, and that—that's just one punishment, right? Like I mean, you, you know, what if what if your spouse said, "Well, you, you know." Oh, I'm going to disable our Netflix account. I don't know. I, I'm <laughs> trying to give a non-financial example. Yeah, it's a little yeah, hard. Yeah. I see it. I see yeah. it. Okay. I, I got it. So uh, that's interesting. I don't think I have implemented any of these punishments before. Uh, maybe I'm just not that masochistic uh, uh, a person, <laughs> but uh, I may have to try that. Uh, what of the Which of these strategies or tactics have you either used yourself or with family or friends and... If you've got great ideas on how to use any of them with kids, I am all ears um, on that one yeah. as well. Well, <laughs> yeah, I did. My son's almost four, and he there. He went through this period of time where I'm I'm really hoping is at the end of it, where every time he would get angry, he would destroy something in his room, and then like almost while he was destroying, he would be upset. And I saw him sort of picking up like his like there was like a. a what do you call it? The Playmobil like fire truck. And I was like, I just want you to think about how you're going to feel if you break this. And and he still sort of slammed it down. So I don't think that really worked <laughs> with him. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of things that I've done personally. So, you know, one is um, I've tried to have that conversation with my future self vis-a-vis parenting. So not, not about the fin- financial, you know, sort of element of my life. Um, but, more about sort of like how I am with my kids. And I've sort of had this, you know, ongoing conversation of like, what's that future version of me going to look back on happily? What's he going to look back on regretfully? Um, I, you know, as a sort of analogy, when I was in graduate school, um, Wi-Fi became available on laptops and Facebook became available. And there was one quarter where I was in one class and I think I, you know, was like 50% dialed in. And 
I look back at that and I, it's like one of my biggest regrets because it was a class that I like really would have benefited from mm -hmm. a lot more had I like been more dialed in. There's professors who were like amazing. And I was so swept up in like whatever I could do. Like the second it got boring in class, I would go on Facebook. And that's the type of thing where I think I was present oriented in the moment and in the long run, I've really regretted it. And so, you know, applying that same thinking, like what are the things I'm going to have done now where I'm like, you know, I think we all have experienced that like moment of boredom with kids and, you know, or my phone is out and it's so easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, and I'm going to look back and I know, I know I'm going to look back at some point and like kids aren't going to be around as much. And it's like, it makes me sad almost to think, am I missing out on something because of like Instagram or Twitter? Right. Like what, what long-term benefit is there for that? You know? Um, so having that conversation has helped me sort of appreciate the the tension that I have and appreciate the need to be more present. It doesn't mean that I'm always more present. But then sort of like enacting it, putting it into practice, um, I mean, in a very practical level, um, I have now become the proud owner of this thing called a K-Safe. And, oh, you know, I think I know what yeah, this is. I, Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I, you know, I spotlight the guy in the book, Dave Krippendorf, he created this when he was in grad school. He called it the kitchen safe. Mm -hmm. And it was like, so that he could curb his snacking problems. He went on Shark Tank and he wins a bunch of money. And it, it's essentially what he's created is a box <laughs> with a lock mm -hmm. and the lock has a digital timer on it. Mm -hmm. And you can set it from a minute to 10 days. And when I was talking, I was just curious. I reached out to him. We talked about it. He said, he's had so many people write to him. They use it for things like drugs and alcohol and video game controllers and anything that's a temptation you know mm -hmm. so it's not mm -hmm. a kitchen safe this is, let's just call it a case safe so i said oh i want to try one and he said well what do you want to use it for what's your biggest temptation and it's like it's my phone yeah you know mm -hmm. easily mm -hmm. and he was like well it's good to know that because we have a clear box and i have an opaque one mm -hmm. and for the phone i'm going to give you the opaque one because you don't even want to I, now, I like to think of myself as someone who wouldn't be like trying to peer in to see what text messages I've right. got. You know, he said, but take away the temptation entirely. So I have one now. I can't say that I like, you know, use it every day, mm -hmm. but like many nights a week, I'll put it in there like around dinner time when the kids are home and I want to be like present, pop it in there for two hours. And it is like the most freeing experience because I've just... I've removed the emotional aspect of the temptation entirely. It's just not even like present you know, because when I'm sitting at dinner and I, the phone's on the table or even if it's in the kitchen, even if I'm not on it, I'm thinking about it. I know it's there. I know it's something I could look at. And that now it's just, it's gone. It's not a possibility. Yeah. I love that. That's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. I've got the, I, I implemented a, a change for myself. It was, to put my phone somewhere else while we're having dinner. Cause I, right. I, I know I do not want to be looking at my phone while we're having dinner. And right. I'd, so I just put it in another part of the room, but to your point, like it's still there and it's still like, it's probably a temptation. Like as soon as we get up from dinner, I'm probably just unconsciously grabbing it, checking it, looking at, email who knows I'm unconsciously probably just looking at twitter or whatever else but mm -hmm. i think there mm -hmm. probably is something to that just like psychological complete separation or total separation period of time and it's not that's not a long two period of time put it in there from like six to eight and exactly it's like yeah it's you can just legit focus on your kids um, during that time yeah. period i think that's a i think that's a really great one um yeah well, thank you for sharing that with one with me, and uh, and I know we're we're sort of coming to the close of our conversation here. Um, uh, this has been awesome. I think um, I, I I really want to encourage everyone to go check out your work because I think there's we've we've kind of covered the the tip of the iceberg here, but there's so much more to get into um, around some of the mechanics of behavior change and um, and this whole idea of connecting, you know, past, present, and future self. Um, but before I let you go, I do want to ask you my standard closing question and you seem to be comfortable tackling big, heady questions. So I'm going to just ask this one to you, uh, straight away. Then one, what's one thing you figured out in life that 
others might others. not have yet? <laughs> um, <laughs> that's such a good question. Um, well, okay. How about, I think that there are times when we can be so overly focused on the future that we miss the present. And the irony is that we also sort of set ourselves up for worse, <laughs> lowered well-being in the future by doing so. You know, so like I, I think I need to work harder because that's going to put me in a better position in the future. And then I keep working harder and harder and um, look up and realize that I haven't been sort of dialed into what's happening right now. And, you know, what sort of present does that create? What sort of future does that create? And so, you know, if there's if, if to answer your question, if there's one thing, it's like trying to figure out the right blend of present focus and future focus and going back and forth between them um, and that it's like it's just not one flavor or one color yeah yeah that's a great great one to end on because i think we can spend so much time thinking about how to hack our way to a better future self that you forget to spend, spend. the time in the present like we were talking about with the with, with your with your family um so i think that makes a ton of sense well um i'm going to enjoy going back to this book um i actually read the audio book to start and then also got the print edition to go back and kind of revisit. Oh, that's awesome. That's like a little habit of mine that I like to do. But um, but uh, yeah, Hal, this has been awesome. It's been great to get to know you a little bit. I really appreciate your work and your sharing. Where, where can people follow you or find you if they want to um, catch up with your work? Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm of course on LinkedIn and Twitter, but HalHirschfield.com has, you know, sort of links to everything. So awesome. that's the spot to go. Okay, cool. Yeah. We'll link to everything uh, in the show notes, and I encourage everybody to go check out uh, Professor Hal Hirschfield's work. Thanks so much, Hal. This has been awesome. Hey, thanks, Greg. I really appreciate it. All right. I hope you found that conversation as intriguing as I did. Definitely go check out Hal and his work. Uh, the book is definitely worth a read. And go check out our sponsor, Athletic Brewing Company. If you want to support me and support the podcast, a great way to do it is by supporting my sponsor. So click on the link in the show notes and use the code WISDOM at checkout to get 15% off your first order at athleticbrewing.com. Finally, be sure to subscribe to the Intentional Wisdom newsletter if you want to receive episode recaps and also my latest thinking on things like habits and routines and motivation, you name it. Uh, and also all the great content that I'm consuming, podcasts, articles, books, videos, I share it all. So it's one email every other week, gregcampion.substack.com. There's a link in the show notes, check it out and let me know what you think. That's it for today, my friends. Thanks for listening and I will see you next time.